Announcing the arrival of Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Binti Kamoro Zaman, Dean of Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and Professor Dr. Ida Nomiha Hilmi. We shall sing the national anthem and lagu Unity of Malaya. A very good afternoon. Yang berbahagia, Professor Dato Dr Adiba binti Kamaru Zaman, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine. Yang berbahagia, Professor Emeritus Dato Dr Tian Li Go. His Excellency Tan Sri Tan Sri Dato Dato Distinguished Guest, Professor Dr Ida Nomiha Hilmi, Management of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Ida Nomiha Hilmi, entitled A Pain in the Gut, The Emergence of Inflammatory Bowel Disease in Malaysia. Without further delay, I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dato Dr. Adiba, to chair the lecture and to introduce Professor Dr. Ida Nomiha Hilmi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the first inaugural lecture for the Faculty of Medicine for 2019. I'm here with to celebrate 
um, Professor Dr. Ilda Ida Hilmi um, of the Department of Medicine. Ida Hilmi is a professor and consultant in gastroenterology at the University of Malaya. She graduated with first class honors from the University of Glasgow in 1997. She went on to do her training in internal medicine at Oxford University and obtained her membership of the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom and the NRCP in the year 2000. She then joined the North East London Gastroenterology Training Program before returning to Malaysia in 2003. She's one of the few who didn't get away. Um, when I asked her what made her come back, uh, and I think it's the story of uh, most of us who almost got away, that it's the pleading calls of our uh, aging parents um, that made her come back. Uh, I must admit um, that story sounded vaguely familiar to me too. So she joined, like I did, the University of Malaya. That was the only only choice, right, Ida, uh, when, when you train overseas. Um, to come back, um, and under Professor Go Ken Lee. She currently heads the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and is the Director of Endoscopy at the University of Malaya Medical Center. She's a committee member of the National Gastroenterology and Hepatology Training Program as well as the founder and chairman of the Malaysian Inflammatory Bowel Disease Special Interest Group. I think it's fair to say that um, Ida has made um, inflammatory bowel disease uh, rather sexy. Um, you know, when I, I first returned to Malaysia, I, I where I trained in Australia, used to see a lot of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and um, didn't see much um, in Malaysia. But uh, Ida has proven us all wrong that it is a disease that's uh, very much here uh, in our country. She's a member of the Asia Pacific Working Group in Inflammatory Bowel Disease and the Asia Pacific Working Group in Colorectal Cancer Screening, the Asian Endoscopic Ultra Ultrasound Group. And her research interests include inflammatory bowel disease, EUS, and colorectal cancer screening. And she has published extensively in these areas. And this afternoon, she's going to tell us what that pain in the gut is. And um, I'm sure we'll have a, a wonderful afternoon with you, Dad, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baba Diva. Thank you, uh, Prof. Alex, for the kind introduction. Okay, so, um, so my, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Ida Nurmiha Hilmi, and I've been a lecturer in the University of Malaya since 2003. And I think you could say that me being here in University of Malaya is li it's a case of life coming full circle, because if it weren't for this university, I wouldn't have existed at all. You see, my parents, as you can see here, uh, are both alumni of University of Malaya. They both did their Bachelor of Arts uh, in 1966. And, um, and yeah, actually, actually uh, the, I have to say that the University of Malaya they described at that time was really quite different. It sounded like so much fun, you know, they explained about all the gatherings and parties and yeah, all, all the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it certainly seems a lot more, you know, serious now. Uh, and I think at that time also there was a very small select group of uh, students, including my uncle, uh, Tansri Marzuki, is also alumni from University of Malaya. And I think it was always their wish uh, for me to pursue my studies here as well. But um, I guess life had other plans for me. So um, I graduated a little bit further away uh, in uh, the University of Glasgow. However, here I am back in University of Malaya, where I have been for the last 15 years. And I have to say that's far longer than my parents ever were. Okay, so for the non-medics in the audience, allow me to just uh, talk a little bit about my subspecialty area and the focus of this talk, uh, which is on inflammatory bowel disease. So inflammatory bowel disease, what is it? It's a chronic, long-standing disease where mainly the large and small bowel becomes inflamed and ulcerated. It's an autoimmune condition. In other words, the one, uh, one's own immune system starts to attack the individual organs and there are many such examples like systemic lupus, erythematosus, uh, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. 
It's classically divided into ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And in, in Malaysia and everywhere in the world, it usually occurs in young adults. So in Malaysia, the median age is 29. But there's an increasing incidence in the pediatric population as well, which uh, Professor Lee Weisia, Professor Chris Boyle will attest to. So just to show you uh, the difference between uh, someone with normal colon and uh, someone with inflammatory bowel disease, this is an endoscopic image of someone with a normal colonoscopy. And this is um, the endoscopic image of someone with inflammatory bowel disease. So what is the difference between these two? Well, I mean, generally they're quite similar, but ulcerative colitis usually affects the colon and they tend to present with chronic bloody diarrhea, whereas in Crohn's disease, well, it can affect anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, but uh, the colon is still a common place, and the terminal ileum where the small bowel joins the colon, and um, abdominal pain, diarrhea are the main symptoms. They often get quite a lot of weight loss and fever, and in gastrointestinal condition, but they get other things like joint pain, uh, rashes, and sometimes <laughs> bowel obstruction, bowel perforation, fistula, hemorrhage, colorectal cancer. Because it's an autoimmune condition, it's coming from one's own self. There is no cure, so treatment is lifelong. And the treatment uh, at this moment, unfortunately, is just to suppress the immune system in the long term. And if there are complications, then I have to refer them to Prof. April. Uh, where they then have to undergo bowel resection. So what about my own journey into inflammatory bowel disease? Well, I guess you could say it started 20 years ago uh, when I was, uh, when I actually did my internal medicine rotation, where I did my gastroenterology stint. This is the John Radcliffe Hospital where I worked. And uh, I think it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that actually the IBD unit in Oxford has produced many of the who's who in the world of IBD. And I was actually fortunate because I got to work with quite a few of them. This, was Derek, this is Derek Jewell, who was my consultant, Jack Sitsangi, Miles Park, these are all big names, uh, all uh, professors. I mean, Derek is retired now in uh, UK at the moment. Subsequently, I also got to work with uh, people when I came back to Malaysia from the Oxford Centre. This is Simon Travis, who now heads the IBD unit, Dermot McGovern in Cedar sinai Los Angeles, and closer to home, my good friend Lin Kun Lin in Singapore. I then uh, went to Cambridge and Adden Brooks Hospital, where I did my first year as a gastroenterology trainee. The exciting part at that time was the identification of the first IBD gene, okay, the nod 2 card 15 gene, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And I, it's actually in Cambridge where I actually learned how to use nutritional therapy in the treatment of Crohn's disease. I then got what is called a numbered post, a, a full-time uh, specialist registrar post in the national training program, and that was in Northeast London rotation. And that's where I had the first uh, experience with biologics, because biologics, which is arguably one of the most effective treatments for moderate to severe inflammatory bowel disease at this time, was only introduced in about 2000. And this was actually also where I learned how to do colonoscopy with intubation of the terminal ileum, which is very important for an IBDologist. So this lady here is Dr. Hanan El Malik, and she was the one who taught me how to do colonoscopies. I got shouted at quite a lot, I have to say. So um, to my gastroenterology fellows, past and present, now you know why I shout at you too when you're doing when I'm teaching you colonoscopy. <laughs> anyway, uh, these are my nurses here at the Homerton Hospital. Anyway, uh, I have to say that um, in addition to commencing my career in gastroenterology, you could say that the other most important outcome in my Northeast London rotation was that I met my future husband, uh, Alexander Loch. This is us uh, on one of our earlier dates, uh, 16 kilograms ago. Oh, sorry, sorry, I meant 16 years ago. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we met when we were uh, on call uh, during Christmas, uh, and the rest, they say, is history. So, anyway, after 12 years and many, many painful uh, pleas and tears from my parents, as Prof. Adiva said earlier, I finally came back home to Malaysia. So just to show you that this was me 
when I first arrived in UK, 18 years of age, and I was still young and innocent, by the way, and this was me and when I was 30 years of age, where of course I'm still young and innocent. Why is everyone laughing? <laughs> anyway, so, um, I, so when I finally arrived in Malaysia in 2003. And I see this is a very early photo of you and me, Professor Go. Yes, how we looked then. Huh? Anyway, uh, I, I was very lucky. I joined the prestigious gastroenterology unit under uh, Dr. Professor Emeritus Dr. Kanli Go. I really have to thank my uncle, um, the late uh, Professor Tan Sri Murad, for that, and some kind words from Professor Imran, uh, my cousin in law. And um, really, uh, as soon as I arrived, um, I uh, really, uh, Professor Go uh, encouraged. Oh, I don't know how that happened, Professor Go. <laughs> anyway, I was in encouraged by Professor Gail Go to develop an IBD database because he said I came from UK, I had quite a lot of exposure with IBD uh, that was initially set up by Professor Tanya May. And after a lot, the long honeymoon period, I finally published the first paper on the clinical features of Crohn's disease. I think it's a standing joke that my colleague Professor Chan Wak Chong took three months to publish a paper after he joined the gastroenterology unit. It only took me three short years. Incidentally, there are only three of us oldies left in the gastro unit from that, you know, the gastroenterology unit from that time. I'll uh, leave it to you uh, to work out uh, who the other two oldies are. So, before I talk a little bit about my own uh, research in IBD, I went through a little bit about the historical data on IBD, and it was quite interesting. The first paper that was published was actually from University of Malaya by TTK in 1979, when he reported 10 cases of UC and 10 cases of CD over 10 years. It was 10 years later when Kutva and Teinhardt um, and uh, uh, described uh, cases of UC. And in 1990, Professor K.L. Go and colleagues presented an abstract on only 13 patients with Crohn's disease at the World Congress of Gastroenterology in Sydney. And it took 15 years later before Tanya and May, who I spoke uh, about, she's left now, uh, to publish a paper on 42 uh, cases of Crohn's disease. And my paper that was published in 2006, uh, sorry, on ulcerative colitis, and my paper in 2006 was a follow-up paper on Crohn's disease. What I found was very interesting was that all these things, all these observations that had been noted all that time, actually still holds true today. There is definitely a racial predominance among the Indian ethnic groups, high rate of surgery of up to 50%, and difficulty in differentiating Crohn's disease from intestinal tuberculosis. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. So this was the study at that time in 2006, only 34 patients, and uh, these were the main findings that I told about. As I said before, uh, high rates of surgery up to 50%, and sadly, in some cases, mortality as well, when these patients had spontaneous perforations and died of sepsis. What about ulcerative colitis? Well, I suppose after I came back, I started uh, developing a network of uh, all the gastroenterologists in Malaysia. And so then we did a follow-up study uh, with more numbers. This time, we recruited six centers from Kedah, Pera, Klang Valley, Kota Kinabalu, and Kuching where we looked at 118 patients with ulcerative colitis. And uh, what we found is that quite a lot of them had extensive disease, but um, actually in terms of colectomy rate, it wasn't very high because they didn't seem to have, if you compare it to Western data, the same number of cases of toxic megacolon, hemorrhage, and colon cancer. Having said that, though, it's not all good news. So I was invited to give a speech in Singapore last year specifically on IBD-associated colon cancer. And this retrospective study from UMMC in the last 15 years on 310 patients, we actually identified six cases of colon cancer, actually, which makes the prevalence at about 1.93%. But look at the median age. The median age of these patients who developed colon cancer was 38 years old. And I'm sure Prof. April will tell you that that is no, uh, that's about two decades probably younger uh, than those with sporadic colorectal cancer. Most of them were in the rectum, and even more disturbingly, that at least half of them actually presented 
with late stage disease, stage three and stage four. Now, it, some of these defaulted follow-up and so on, but at least two of those cases unfortunately developed their cancer despite regular colonoscopic surveillance, which only tells us that whatever we're doing, we're not doing a good enough job, and that's hopefully a case for further research in terms of image-enhanced endoscopy and so on. One such case is this 42-year-old Chinese man who was diagnosed with extensive ulcerative colitis in 2005, not responding to treatment. I did advise him many times for a colectomy because he was just not getting better despite every treatment uh, that I could throw at him, but he, he didn't want it. Surveillance colonoscopy picked up this lesion, okay, but uh, the histology at that time was not suggestive of dysplasia or cancer, so he still refused to have his surgery. He had the same findings in 2011. Unfortunately, though, the colonoscopy in 2012 um, was highly suggestive of rectal carcinoma, and this time it was confirmed on histology. He then immediately went for his colectomy, but was found to have stage 3 disease. So moving on, I just to talk a little bit about the um, pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. And I'm sure this is a question that a lot of my patients are asking me. Why me? Why? How does it happen? The truth is, nobody knows. We do know that uh, it's a combination of the genes, uh, of genes in the environment. You have a genetically susceptible individual, but it's not enough because I've actually got two sets of twins and one identical twin has it and one identical twin does not. You need some sort of environmental trigger. Nobody knows what this trigger is. Could it be, you know, sterile environment in childhood, too much antibiotic use, too much McDonald's? That's always the popular theory. I guess no one can really say. But what does happen as a result of that is that you get a dysregulation of the innate and adaptive immune system, and this results in uncontrolled inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. So looking specifically at the genetics of that, as I told you before, the first gene was the NOD2 CAR15 gene that was discovered in 2001, but after genome-wide association studies were introduced, there really was an explosion of putative genes that were identified in IBD. This is one on Crohn's disease, but there have been cases in, in uh, ulcerative colitis as well. So this is the NOD2 CAR15 gene, which is a fairly important gene, and uh, three mutations were identified in the Western population. However, what was interesting was that the, these mutations that were found were not found in the Han Chinese, the Japanese, or the South Koreans. And so it did get me thinking, but well, you know what, we're a multi-ethnic population, we have the Malays, we have the Indians, could it be that if we did a study, we were going to find these uh, mutations that were not seen in the predominantly homogeneous oriental population? So, I think everyone knows the well-known saying, it's not what you know sometimes, but it's who you know. And so I had uh, the good fortune of meeting this young man over here. For those of you who don't know him, it, this is Professor Chua Ke King. And it's no, um, you know, it is well known that he's one of the top research scientists in Malaysia, named recently. And Ke King and I uh, actually met in 2005 along with Professor Sanjeev during a cursus induxi, or induction course. And uh, bet I think between, uh, so actually in between learning Chiri Chiri Malayan Union and visits from Bagian Penjaga Raswa and things like that, uh, we actually also got to talking, uh, Kek Heng and I, and I told him about this idea of actually looking at this particular uh, genetic mutations. And uh, that was what we came up with, is this was the study done by Kek Heng's group. And uh, what he found was that actually we didn't find those common mutations, like what I postulated. But uh, Chua actually managed to pick up some other novel mutations. And what was very interesting was that one of the mutations, which is the SNP5, is associated with Indian ethnicity. At about the same time, a study was published in Elementary Pharmacology and Therapeutics in India, which actually showed SNP5 to also be an important mutation in the Indian population. So I thought that was very in uh, interesting, actually. And the truth of the matter is, I can't keep up with the publications that Chua has produced uh, in the genetics of IBD since then. There's a whole list of them here. However, Ke King, I have to say to you, I'm a, I'm a clinician, okay? So for me, I want to ask, how is that going to affect my patients, you know? 
how's that going to help? Because at the moment, currently, there's no, whole, uh, there's no role for genetic testing in the diagnosis of IBD. But I think the ultimate aim of understanding it is providing an individualized approach in the management of this condition. Because, for example, you have mutations in interleukin-23 gene, and could it be that biologics that are being developed now that specifically targeted, like ustekinumab, mirikizumab, and so on, maybe those biologics are more, more important for these group of patients than it would be for someone else. So we don't know that yet, but it's a case of watch this space. So moving on to epidemiology. So IBD, as uh, Pravadiba was saying, is predominantly a Western disease with high rates among the Caucasian populations. But the overall incidence and prevalence of IBD in Asia is low, although we do know that the incidence and prevalence is increasing. That led me to another fortuitous encounter. This beautiful lady here is Professor Xu Chen Ng, and uh, she's actually from Penang, you know. Uh, I think uh, Alex and uh, Prof Go will argue that all the best people come from Penang, right? Including my dad, actually. So, um, but, uh, and, uh, but Xu Ng, being a phenomenal researcher, unfortunately decided, you know, to uh, go to Chinese University of Hong Kong to carry out her research. And she actually started this Asia-Pacific Crohn's and Colitis Epidemiology Study, the AXA study it's called, which Kale Go and I are part of. And um, since then, um, so we published really collectively the first paper, a multi-center study looking at the incidence and phenotype of inflammatory bowel disease. And she's published multiple other papers uh, since then. But I wanted some local data. Or Prof Go was saying you have to have some local data. So um, he said, look, uh, we need to know what the incidence and prevalence in Malaysia. He said, so I think you should write a separate paper, even though we're contributing cases to uh, CU. And uh, so I wrote it up. You know, I, I used the same sample population in Ipo, and uh, I, I, I gave it to KLGO. And uh, he said, mm, OK, OK. He looked at it. He made some revisions. And he said, but you know, Ida, you need a catchy name, he said. You need a catchy name in order to get it published in a good journal. He said. Otherwise, it won't sell. So, and I think, I don't know this for sure, Professor Go, that he may have gotten his inspiration from this old cohort called the Olmsted County Cohort in America, started in 1940s. And because of that, he came up with the name, of course, uh, you know, uh, the Quinta Valley Cohort, or the Quinta Valley IBD Epidemiology Study was born. The fact that the uh, Olmsted County cohort had 30,000 and we had 300 is all besides the point. Anyway, um, this is the findings from the Quinta Valley study. The incidence is indeed very low at less than uh, 1 per 100,000 population. And this is much lower if you compare it to uh, Australia when it's 25 per 100,000 population. The highest incidence is among the Indian ethnic group compared to the Malays and the Chinese. And likewise, for the prevalence, is about 9 per 100,000 population. Again, the highest prevalence among the Indians. And I think if you take that into consideration, I would estimate there are about two to 3,000 people living with inflammatory bowel disease in Malaysia, which, of course, is not a high number. However, what we did note was that there was an increasing in the incidence uh, in the last few decades in parallel with other Asian populations. Now, I have to say, Professor Go, I think it must have worked, this uh, catchy name thing, because I will tell you that the Kinta Valley study uh, actually was featured quite prominently in a systemic review on population-based studies on worldwide incidence and prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease in the 21st century that was published in The Lancet in 2017. Okay, so in order to... Uh, not let you have to hear me speak for the whole one hour and also not to hear myself speak for one hour. Uh, what I have asked is for my IBD patients to uh, do some short video clips, um, mainly to tell what it's like uh, about living with IBD, really to bring it home. So I'll be interspersing my talks with a few short clips, and this is going to be the first one. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Kobu of Tiruvannakan. I'm 39 years old this year. I've been having Crohn's since 2013. I've been diagnosed in uh, Sumajaya Medical Center. Currently, I'm following up in Pusat Kabupaten University Mayan under Prof. Ida, the gastro team, and also under Prof. April, the surgical side. 
I have actually gone for three laparotomy, and uh, currently I'm on stoma back due to my recent surgery in 2016 after the reversal of stoma, which requires me to wear stoma back due to the intracutaneous fistula. Hi, my name is Anis. I'm 54 years old, and I've had Crohn's for 10 years. I started off with on the clinical trials for Vitaliazumab, or however you pronounce it, and then went on to Azathioprin, which I had an adverse reaction to, and now I'm on Mecaptopurin and Um First five years, I would say, was probably the hardest. It it was a struggle. There was a fight to be normal. It was a fight to get better. Uh, since then, I think things have stabilized and I'm better anyway. Hi, my name is Saran Nagapun. I am 29 years old. I'm a senior auditor working in Christian Jor and Gun. I'm Crohn's patient. At 2008, I had my first symptoms. Uh, with a fistula, but was diagnosed that I have for Crohn's in 2012. And that, we yeah, are four years of times, I went for a few times of surgery. And um, at last, in 2012, August, I was diagnosed that I have Crohn's. Uh, I'm Dr. Roshi. Um, I'm originally from Johor, and I'm working as a medical officer in Hospital Kuala Lumpur in the dermatology department. And I have Crohn's disease. I've been diagnosed with Crohn's disease since the age of 25 years old. And um, I'm currently on Infusima Biologics um, since my 27. I'm currently 31 years old. And um, I'm married. I have no children yet. Um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease um, when I was in medical school. Uh, at that time, I had uh, loss of appetite, loss of weight. Uh, I constantly had diarrhea more than 20 times per day and uh, it took some time for diagnosis to happen um, because I did not really seek treatment immediately I thought it was just uh, IBS or something and then eventually I did um, seek treatment and therefore I was uh, diagnosed with Crohn's disease uh, at that time also I had perianal fistulas requiring uh, surgeries and subsequently after commencing on eczema, um, my Crohn's uh, disease were really stable. Okay, so yeah, I mean these patients are very young, uh, they have to work, so you can imagine what it's like for them. So uh, the next section, I'm just going to change tact a little bit, where I'll be talking a little bit about the current challenges in the diagnosis of management of inflammatory bowel disease in Malaysia. So there are many, okay, but I'm just going to focus on a couple. One is a diagnostic dilemma, and why it's a diagnostic dilemma is because in Malaysia, infection is endemic, okay, and, uh, and the differentiation between uh, inflammatory bowel disease, idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease, and infective uh, enterocolitis can be very difficult. And to highlight this case, I just want to talk about uh, one patient, a 33-year-old Indian man. He presented in 2003 with recurrent perianal fistula. It was under surgical follow-up. Uh, he then presented in 2005 with a three-month history of weight loss, uh, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. I did screen him for TB. I did a chest x-ray. I did a Montu test. It was negative. But uh, his granulomas, uh, the, his, the biopsy showed very large granulomas, but the AFB was negative. And uh, the conclusion was consistent with Crohn's disease, but TB cannot be ruled out, was kind of how it ended. Uh, however, look at the time. That was in 2003. I had just come back. So I was thinking, TB? What, what TB? You know. So as far as I was concerned, this was Crohn's disease, and I treated him as such. I gave him steroids. I gave him azathioprine. And he... You know, he's a little bit of a quiet man. He said, yeah, a bit better, a bit better. But, you know, not really that well. He never gained any weight. Anyway, 
If there's a diagnostic dilemma, I don't suggest that you try this at home. One way of doing it is suppressing someone with intestinal tuberculosis with azathioprine because a year later, when I did the colonoscopy again, because he wasn't getting better, his granulomas, it just coalesced to this massive one, and this time there were multiple AFBs stain on staining on, uh, on histology. And I guess really um, this whole thing about whether or not it's intestinal TB or whether or not it's Crohn's disease is a perpetual dilemma for us gastroenterologists. Actually, I get asked to give talks on this quite a lot, and I love to put up this slide because I like to ask, uh, you know, specialists like Professor Sanjay or Prof Go or Prof Effendi and Dr. Nazri, what do you think it is? Which one is Crohn's and which one is tuberculosis, you know, and see whether or not they can guess it correctly. And most of the time, they're going to get it wrong. Uh, it's really a big problem uh, because, of course, if you give TB steroids, you're going to make them worse. You know, but if you give them, uh, if you have Crohn's disease and you give them anti-TB, well, then it's also not good. So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem, really. But what about the treatment uh, for Crohn's disease? Well, as I told you before, uh, actually, the treatment is all aimed at long-term immunosuppression. And these are the common drugs that we use. And you can see here that uh, these are all the serious side effects that you can get uh, from all these treatments. However, perhaps even more pertinent than that is the cost of the therapy. Even the salazine costs about 3,000 to 5,000 a year, which is still quite difficult for someone who's just starting out in life. But as I told you before, the most effective treatment in moderate uh, to severe uh, inflammatory bowel disease are biologics, be it anti-TNFs, uh, infliximab, adalumumab, or uh, the anti-adhesion molecule antagonists like vitoluzumab. These are good drugs indeed, but look at the cost, 20,000 to 50,000 a year. Um, and unfortunately, government funding is very limited for these patients, uh, so I really struggle. I struggle all the time, you know, begging, uh, you know, uh, social workers to try and get uh, additional help for these patients. So Adiba, if you can, uh, Prof. Adiba, if you can, you know, try and get some of your HIV uh, funding my way, <laughs> I would be very grateful. Anyway, and of course, to top it all off, the treatment is generally lifelong. What about surgery in IBD? So this was a study that uh, Prof. April uh, spearheaded, where basically, uh, because as I said before, despite advances in medical therapy, quite a large number of patients will still require uh, surgery in their lifetime. But unfortunately, this study showed that up to 50% of patients who need bowel surgery, they initially refuse it because they don't want a stoma. Imagine if you were 20 years old and somebody says to you, well, you might have a permanent stoma. We may have to carry a bag for the rest of your life. Do you think you take it? No. Okay, it's completely understandable. The problem is, of course, as you might imagine, those who initially refuse surgery have a, high, a far higher rate of emergency surgery and complications. So, and the other thing is understanding it. How many of the non-medical profession have even heard of inflammatory bowel disease? A lot of people ask me, What's that? You know, and that, that's the problem, really. So, uh, and the psychosocial impact on this, I think you, wouldn't, uh, you cannot underestimate. So this I is the second video. I was absolutely lying on the bed. I couldn't leave the house. My, my mom will cry every night. My dad will hug me and say, my dad started doing grocery shopping just to punish me. And my dad was like, you know, I just didn't have the appetite to eat. Every day I would just eat maybe one or two spoons of rice and then I'd go back to sleep. I took a lot of venture, the milk. Uh, yeah, that's how I became interested in that. Yeah, and then uh, I was introduced to Prof. Ida, uh, by one of my church members who is also a peace gastro in the UF. Uh, I'm also working as a pharmacist in the Ministry of Health and uh, I do have support from the working side whereby my Bosses at the same time, my working colleagues do understand my situation and gives full support in that sense. Uh, since I am very close to my back, I do have issues in my daily activities, including managing my children, doing household activities whereby it requires me to bend. I will have issues with my close to my back. Um, the one thing that I would like to stress other than is that having the support of your doctor
doctors, family, friends is really important, but also to find others who have gone through this disease has been um, really important. It's hard to explain to other people who haven't had Crohn's disease what it's like. Sometimes you just need somebody to understand what you're going through and while your friends and family sympathize, they don't actually empathize. <laughs> And it's also good to have people who have had this for longer or um, had different experiences so that when you have questions about medication, about food, about how not to kill somebody because of it, um, there are people who understand and can tell you what they've gone through and maybe you don't think you're weird. Um, other than that, I've been more or less stable for the last eh, two years. Um, you do have normal. I think that the, the hardest part is just trying to cope with the pain, the diarrhea, the fatigue, uh, and people not understanding that this is a disease. And probably the worst thing you can say to any one of us is... But you don't look sick. Okay, so uh, yeah. So the next portion of my uh, slide that's re is really about uh, what we've tried to do collectively um, to overcome some of these challenges. So I want to introduce you to the IBD Special Interest Group. Uh, some of them are in the audience here today. We just founded on the uh, 24th of August in 2014. And I think it's made up of uh, adult and pediatric gastroenterologists, such as Prof. Lee Reisia, uh, Prof. Christopher Boy, Prof. Fendi, Dr. Nasri, Prof. Alex Liao, uh, and uh, Dr. Radzi, uh, April, you know, just to name a few. And we've really, uh, really decided to have a whole task, um, you know, we set out the task of doing several things, develop a treatment algorithm, uh, educational workshops, uh, tertiary referrals and so on and so forth in order to try and educate uh, as well as empower uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And so uh, we launched this treatment algorithm, algorithm for inflammatory bowel disease. It's available online. Dr. Nazri and I uh, mainly did it. Uh, so that was launched in 2015. Um, this is hot off the press, actually. This, uh, the patient information leaflet, also very important, was actually spearheaded by Professor Fendi's group in UKM. Uh, so we're in the midst of finalizing that at the moment. Uh, so that will also be available to everyone once, it's, uh, you know, once we get it ready out there. We've actually sponsored a lot of uh, educational events. This is me and uh, Prof. April in uh, Kota Kinabalu. And um, these are some other events uh, that uh, we've conducted as well. We've really had many uh, road shows and so on and so forth. And at the same time, as I said before, uh, it's actually very important to have a support you know, of, of your other people or fellow sufferers. So the first patient support group for IBD in Malaysia was started in 2015. And so they also carry out road shows of which we take turns to give talks for. So you can see here one of them. Uh, and also we had a public forum on, uh, we actually sell, uh, had our first public forum on inflammatory bowel disease at the IOL, IMO in 2015 as well. And I think it's very, very important, this thing. At, the same, at the same time, uh, we do have IBD support group and I share my experience with uh, other friends, patients who has similar issues like mine. Uh, the exchange of experience in how to manage the uh, including prostomy back issues or taking medicine or what are the diets that uh, we can take in order to help these fistula issues. Uh, at the same time, uh, I do have uh, support from the family. My wife understands my situation. So there are days where I need to rest fully due to my flag condition. Uh, she understands totally my situation. 
I have a good support from my family and friends, my doctors, especially uh, Prof. Shanti, Prof. Fida, Prof. Raja and many dog based roles from HUKM and UMMC. They were very good doctors and um, they keep updating, they give a good information and um, I just follow their advice. If in case I need any moral support, I meet, meet, meet up with my friends or any other patient that have Crohn's, I talk to them. And we're having a sharing and for your information, we have uh, Crohn's support groups which uh, we meet up together. Uh, we, we discuss what's the current issues for the, every patient and what's the conditions. And we try to give a motivation and any other support to them to make sure they are, can manage their Crohn's very well. Um, I would really like to thank Prof. Ida and her amazing team who have always been there for me and always been there for all the patients, especially in this disease, you know, um, flares can happen anytime and they are always ready to be there for all of us. I really, really thank Prof. Ida and team. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank Prof. Ida uh, throughout these eight years, uh, she has been treating me and uh, every time I have a problem and I go to her or even when I send her a message, she will just reply me and I, I really just want to thank uh, Prof. Eli and even all the nurses uh, at the daycare um, team. Yeah, I just cannot imagine um, how life would be uh, yeah, if I not met Prof. Yeah. I, I promise I didn't pay them to say that. Um, I have to thank them, really. Uh, they put a lot of effort, actually, into uh, doing those uh, video clips. Uh, so to uh, my patients out there in the audience, uh, thank you so much. Um, in uh, 2017, we also have our first uh, dedicated IBD clinic in University of Malaya Medical Center. It's a specialist run only walk in clinic. It's very important to have walk in clinics, I think, for these patients because, you know, can you imagine you have a flare and your appointment is in the next four months? So I think it's, uh, that was really the point of it. And uh, this is my team over here. Prof. Alex, sorry, you were in Singapore. So, you know, uh, usually Alex runs it with me. So uh, he wasn't there uh, when I took this photo. And, uh, and I guess that's it, really. So um, coming to the end of my lecture, um, I want to conclude by saying that um, for someone who is, um, as Louisa May Alcott, uh, you know, to borrow a phrase from Louisa May Alcott, hopelessly flawed, and I think no one knows this better than the people who love me the most, I, I, I've really been extremely blessed. So um, I want to end my lecture by saying um, thank you uh, to count my blessings. Uh, I have a wonderful husband, uh, Professor Alex Loch. Uh, you can remind me of that, Alex, the next time we have a fight. <laughs> um, and um, my two beautiful children, Johan and Maya. My uh, parents who are, you know, who made me what I am today. I'll try not to cry. <laughs> um, who've been a rock. Um, my siblings, um, my in-laws, my nephews my um, extended family, my uncles, my aunties, my cousins, my best, uh, even my girlfriend that she's left now, you know, my girlfriends uh, who I've known since I was seven years old, you know, uh, and also my German family, you know, I mean, how lucky is that to have two families, a Malaysian family and a German family at the same time? Um, and also my work colleagues, I mean, it's, um, it's, I think, I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that our gastroenterology unit is one of the uh, nicest units to work in. Right, fellows? <laughs> so, um, you know, we just, uh, we, the camaraderie is, is, is really good and it's a place that I um, enjoy going to work, uh, you know, every day. Uh, oh, Kuhat, because your photo is not in that photo, I just added a photo of you. You know, just so that you wouldn't feel left out. <laughs> um, my nurses over there, uh, you know, uh, who, uh, who are simply wonderful. The rest of uh, the staff in the um, endoscopy unit, really. Uh, these are my collaborators uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, they, they've all been, you know, really fantastic as well. I also want to... Um, 
thank some other people. Special thanks to my mentor and friend, Professor Emeritus Canley Go. Can you give him a round of applause? I also want to thank my research assistants, past and present, Mrs. Chung, Mrs. Mani, Sashi, Lorraine, Shin Yi, Syed, you know, all of them played their role in my research and everything, my collaborators, the patients uh, that I told you who made such a big effort for me, industry who've also been very supportive in our, uh, you know, pledge to improve IBD management in this country, the staff from the Department of Medicine, there are really so many people I owe my gratitude to, I, I really can't mention them all. I have to give a special thanks to Zara, Rohana, technical crew, and everyone else who've been uh, uh, so, for the tireless effort, really, in organizing this lecture. I'm a very last-minute person. I think I caused them a lot of stress, like, Prof, are you ready with this yet? And I'd be like, yeah, wait for us, wait for us, you know, and then it'll just go on and on and on. So I think I gave her a lot of stress, Zara, in particular. Um, okay, so... If I were to summarize my 20 years in my 20 year journey in inflammatory bowel disease and gastroenterology for that matter, I have to accept a few things. I have to accept that at 46 years of age, I, um, it's unlikely that I'm going to find that major breakthrough or cure in inflammatory bowel disease. So to my patients, I'm, I'm very sorry for that. But what I hope, I will continue to do, however, through myself and uh, through being a mentor and educator to the younger generation, like K.L. Go was to me, uh, is to play a very small part in order to make a positive difference in the lives of these patients. And I guess, as doctors, it's something we can all do. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor Ida, for the inspiring and a very touching uh, lecture. Really touch. Distinguished guests, I would like to call upon Yang Berbagia, Professor Dato Dr. Adiba, to conclude the lecture which has been delivered by Professor Dr. Ida a moment ago. Please welcome Professor Adiba. Okay, good afternoon again, and my job is to summarize what Ida has shared with you, and I think um, there were two quick summaries that um, the take-home messages from her, her inaugural lectures. One is, if you want to succeed, it's who you know, and if you want to publish, it's uh, make sure you pick a sexy uh, <laughs> title. But no, in all seriousness, I think um, what Ida has shown us is um, I must salute her for her courage and uh, courage and leadership in choosing uh, what, what we said at the beginning, a relatively rare disease in Malaysia to make that her career choice. It may be rare in terms of epidemiology, but as you heard from the testimony from the patients, uh, it is a very debilitating and... Um, horrible disease to live with. I mean, I, I recall my own experience looking after patients with IBD in, in Australia, and it was not a very pleasant um, disease to look after. And these were in the days, I'm um, a decade older than Ida. This was in the days uh, before um, the, the biologics. So congratulations to you, Ida, for choosing a uh, disease and, and making a difference in the lives of, of your patients, although it's not a disease that um, that is common uh, in this country. But what you have done, I think, uh, has made a difference in the lives of, of your patients, and that's the main thing. Although you, uh, you say that you're not going to be able to find a cure for them, but I think together with Kate Heng and everyone else here, you've made tremendous contribution in terms of uh, the translational research and uh, epidemiological knowledge that, that you've made. And, but of course, in uh, just simply creating the awareness of, of this disease and um, the very, very important practical uh, contributions that you've made with the algorithms and um, patient care management and, and other things that, that you've done. So in conclusion, Ida, I think you epitomize what uh, we want in all our academic 
clinical staff here at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, in that you play all those four roles that we want to see in, in each and every one of us, and that's uh, the teachers in us, the clinical service that we provide, the research that's impactful, and lastly, the community service that you've done. So congratulations. Thank you very much, Professor Adiba. I would, like, I would like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for attending this meaningful occasion. Sincere thanks to the management team of the Faculty of Maxon, citizens of University of Malaya, as well as the guests here for your time. With this, we have reached the end of the lecture. On behalf of the University of Malaya, I would like to apologize if there had been any weaknesses from our side in organizing this lecture. There, with this, there will be a photo session after this. I would like to invite the family members of Professor Ida and invite the guests to proceed to the stage for the photo session. Refreshment will be served at level 4 on top of this uh, auditorium. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you and have a pleasant evening. Thank you.